And so I'll just summarize saying that recovery in schizophrenia is common. Antipsychotic drugs didn't improve long-term outcome. Deinstitutionalization didn't improve social recovery. Recovery is related to local unemployment rate. Outcome declined in the United Kingdom in the 1990s. And finally, disability benefits create a fixable disincentive to employment. I want to stress that. I want, want to stress as one of the things we need to be working on is fixing that very damaging element in our system. Work improves outcome in schizophrenia. Supported employment is an effective rehabilitation model and the social firm model is diffusing rapidly, at least at the moment. Thank you. There are two kinds of early intervention. One is um, you can try and screen people at risk for schizophrenia, say, or psychosis, and intervene early and prevent it from happening. That's the idea. The basic problem with that is that um, the screening method is not adequate and has a very high false positive rate. Uh, so, for example, a common screening instrument that's used in um, Sydney um, Basically, about if, if you screen people and put them in a high-risk category, uh, about a third of those people are going to develop a psychosis within the next year. So if you say, okay, you're at high risk and we're going to prevent your illness by putting you on Risperdal, which is what they do there, uh, it works. Fewer people develop schizophrenia, but two-thirds of them never would have developed schizophrenia anyway, and now they're taking Risperdal and gaining weight and getting the metabolic syndrome. And now a year's gone by, and only one or two people have gotten schizophrenia, but you've got the whole group on Risperdal. Now what are you going to do? Going to leave them on forever? And two-thirds would never have gotten the illness in the first place? No. Um, and the, the guy who did essentially the similar study in New York called McGlashan, um, when, the, when the, his whole thing started, he's on the front page of the uh, New York Times with McGorry, Patrick McGorry, beaming from ear to ear saying, well, this is a great new idea. We we'll try this research project. And then about five years later, and the results are out, this is a picture of McGlashan <laughs> on the front page of the New York Times looking like he's been through the ringer. And he says, uh, so, and the reporter says to him, so, uh, so what do you think? And McGlashan says, well, somebody the other day asked me, um, would, I, uh, would, would I give an opinion about early intervention schizophrenia? And, and I said to him, well, you want me to be for it or against it? <laughs> and he was basically saying he was against it. Um, now, the other form of early intervention, which seems more reasonable, is, uh, and is, is is that you'd intervene early after the person develops the illness, which seems perfectly reasonable. Of course, nobody can argue against that, except um, the grounds for doing it, and it being such a great idea, is that duration of untreated psychosis is related to good outcome. So the shorter the duration of untreated psychosis, the literature shows, the better the outcome. Now, that's interpreted by the advocates of this approach to mean that um, if you intervene early, you're improving the outcome. Well, of course, there's something else which is also true, uh, that if you have a sample of people with a long duration of untreated psychosis, they've got a long duration of psychosis. The people who have a short duration of psychosis have a, who, there, because there are many people who have a good prognosis, psychosis, who recover and spontaneously and get better and disappear, the samples with long duration of untreated psychosis have eliminated or lost the people who already had a good prognosis, psychosis, if you follow me. So the, it's, uh, you can demonstrate that it's only if you're looking at the first six months of the illness that duration of untreated psychosis predicts better outcome. And it's because there's a high spontaneous remission rate during that period anyway that's been demonstrated over and over again. The other problem 
is the one that I started with initially, is that if you take someone with a first break psychotic episode and you treat them without medicines, like in the Soteria project, many of them are going to get better anyway. So if you leap in and put them on Risperdal and say you've got schizophrenia and thank God we caught it in time, now take this medicine every day for the rest of your life, uh, you're actually damaging that person because you're mislabeling them as being somebody who's going to have a long-term illness when in fact a very high proportion, 25% uh, in many studies, are not going to have a long-term illness develop out of that psychosis anyway. And I, I just mentioned that if you go back to uh, the early years of the 1800s, the early 1800s, the madhouse proprietors were saying exactly the same thing. Uh, bring me your person with schizophrenia, uh, with, with a psychosis, when he's only been ill for a week, and I promise you a cure. But if you delay six months, it's hopeless. It's just the same way of looking at the duration of untreated psychosis. But when you look at that example, you can see what it's about. It's about people recover spontaneously anyway. We've lost that capacity to look at our own research with the same kind of clarity. What I'd just like to say is um, I'm a lot happier when you're talking about the micro than you are those rather contentious uh, conclusions that you draw from the macro figures. And I wouldn't dispute just as... I agree with you entirely about early intervention, by the way. But I wouldn't... The arguments about work, to me, are unanswerable. I mean, you're right. I mean, that's what I'd just like to say. I think you're right. But to go back to that point about people being more positive, you see, within Britain, I mean, it is a bit odd. I can't see... We've known about the Trieste examples and Lisbon and Bologna and so on for, I don't know, 30 years, whatever it is. I don't see, and we do have some employment projects, but I don't see that the changes that you see in attitudes, the more positive attitudes, reflected in developing those sorts of projects. Uh, I don't see it, and I, I'm just, I'm sceptical about whether that's going to happen. Well, I'll just, just go back and add one more list to the list of positive changes in in Britain since the economy's improved and that's the, the sudden interest in social firms that's developed since the economy took a turn. I mean, I listed several others. That's just one more. So, you know, I, I'll continue to argue the point and I may be wrong. Could I, could I just respond to that? I mean, in my current role at Birmingham Solihull Mental Health Trust, one of the big thrusts that I'm going to have over the coming year is occupational enablement and um, looking at resourcing and developing a pathway that precisely focuses on occupational enablement, whether that means um, paid employment or meaningful occupation um, are two different things. But looking at meaningful occupation from the get-go in terms of from the point of admission through to um, the social inclusion end where people are supported in, in, in the community. So, so it's not all quite so negative. No, no one could dispute that if you can get into work, that is a, a real big step in the way back to some sort of normality, if you want to call it that, and, 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 and being in society. But I, I don't agree necessarily with some of your arguments about, especially between developed world and developing world. I think there's something about society as a, as a whole. And I, and I think we're talking, we could be talking about more contentment against discontentment. And I think the society that we live in today largely determines that, that as far as mental illness is concerned, it's going to be almost like a plague. It's going to increase because of the social pressures. So I, I, I think you, you, your conclusion that work is something which really improves the, the possible outcome. I, do, I don't think that your argument, I, I, I just don't accept your, your argument as to how, the, how, how, that, how that comes about between the, the, the uh, third world and the developing world. And I think it's a, 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 something that's really in society. And I think you'll find in the third world, the rates will get worse as they develop, as they are starting to do now. Well, I would argue that the rates of recovery will get worse as, um, as wage labor becomes more common in the third world um, because it's, the, the, it's working in the wage labor market which makes it difficult to get rehabilitated. I, I 
I hear your point about, well, maybe stress is less great in the developing world. I'm not sure I agree with it, actually. And I'm, I'm reflecting back to a paper I read back in the 80s, which was conducted by a, a University of Colorado researcher actually down in Mexico. And he went down to somewhere like Mazatlan, uh, a little glorious um, paradise with palm-fringed beaches and people fishing and having a lovely time. And um, he interviewed the people of the town on a random basis about their contentment in life. And the title of his paper was, didn't matter how we asked them, uh, their life was miserable or something like that. And so what they were doing was they were listing all of the, the problems in their lives like bad water, drunken husbands, abusive husbands, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That, and the list of uh, tragic and awful things they had to suffer, including poverty and starvation and infant death and so on, was, was pretty considerable. So uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't make the argument that contentment is greater. Is there any work being done with um, mental health and consumerism and materialism? as opposed to people's general well-being through? No. Because I think a that's a big Has thing. Heard of I think that's, that needs doing, because yeah. I think there's a huge link there. Consumerist culture and mental health. Yeah. Well, I could imagine that it has an effect on mental health, but mm. it might be sort of outside my field of schizophrenia and psychosis. Mm. Because I feel as a society, yeah. through all that, we have actually lost something innate inside us. Yes. that it, it's not being looked at, sure. and it's. I mean, I feel the mental health thing is is a popping up of a of a real illness in individuals, society down to individuals, right. and it happens. You know, the political thing doesn't answer any of that. Well, you could. I think you could certainly argue that alienation is much mm -hmm. uh, greater and stronger in the developed world than in less developed parts of the world, and yeah. in the sense of. Uh, connection to uh, family and uh, your productive role and and um, and the community in general. To, to, the, what, to what extent alienation then damages your mental health is a, is a whole other interesting question. Whether it would have an effect on the outcome from psychosis, it might. Okay. It might have much greater effects on depression, anxiety, and personality disorders. But also people's aspirations change. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's so true.